Welcome to the Geek Therapy Radio pre-roll. 90% of this podcast is definitely James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. A lot of y'all have been waiting for my input on this because I have a sordid history here on this radio show with the JWST and all the crying wolf about launch dates, but it's up now. So we talk mostly about that and then some other geek goodies. So welcome to Geek Therapy Radio. Enjoy. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio. You've got your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. All right, this is it. This is the episode where I finally speak my piece about the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, finally speak my piece. The, the way the reason I'm phrasing it like that is I have talked about the James Webb uh, Space Telescope over the since the inception of Geek Therapy Radio back in 2017 every I would bring it up I would do a show about it every time NASA would release you know James Webb Space Telescope is scheduled to launch on March whatever in you know, like 2017 and then that date would come and go all right James Webb Space Telescope is scheduled to march or er, scheduled to launch in in winter of April or winter of a uh, you know like 2019 or whatever it is those are just arbitrary dates the point is the James Webb Space Telescope I don't know if 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 a lot of y'all realize I would assume that a lot of my listeners realize this but it was supposed to launch well over 10 years ago I think it was supposed to launch in like 2009 the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, as I'll refer to it many times uh, here throughout the podcast and broadcast, uh, it was supposed to launch a long, long time ago. It's been in the works for a long, long time. Over 10 years, it's been in the works. Uh, so I, t- to precurse this conversation, I, I feel like I was so disappointed <laughs> over the last 10 years at all the crying wolf of JWST's launch date. And if y'all remember my longtime listeners, I made a, uh, an announcement, you know, maybe a couple years ago, a year ago, whatever. The last time I talked about JWST, it's kind of like the Atari uh, VCS, uh, not to get too sidetracked. But uh, yeah, I made an announcement about the JWST that I'm just going to stop talking about it. I'm going to go radio silent about the JWST until not only not until it launches, but after it starts uh, sending back the first images from space. It is a million miles away from Earth in orbit. And I said, there is a let's say it let's say it does launch because remember my like my feelings were hurt. It was emotional at this point that I just stopped trusting all the announce, all the the launch date announcements. I said I will basically believe it when I see it. Not only will I believe it after it launches, but I will only believe it until I see the first images. And that is purely coming from a an emotional place where me and astronomers around the world have been routinely let down uh, by these launch date announcements. Now, let me just start here by saying. I completely understand it is nobody's fault that the launch date kept getting put back and put back and put back. Obviously, what scientists and different agencies and what NASA was trying to do here was not just putting up another Hubble Space Telescope. It wasn't just putting up another big reflector in the sky and and pointing it at stuff. It was arguably one of the most immense scientific and technological achievements and undertakings in human history. I I can't stress that enough. This is one of the most challenging technological endeavors human beings have ever made. I'm not going to put it on the exact same scale as getting a human being to the moon, but in many ways, there's a lot more complication in getting the JWST up there, James Webb Space Telescope up there, than there was getting astronauts to the moon. What made the Apollo missions so amazing, and don't get me wrong, it is it the Apollo missions are are kind of one of, if not the top three pinnacles, depending who you ask, of human achievement. And what makes it even more remarkable is that we did that in the 1960s. That whole program dates back even first. So we landed on the moon in July of 1969 uh, with Apollo 11. 
But before that, all the groundwork that NASA had been doing from the basically the 40s, 50s and in the 60s, it was very quick, actually, the way uh, we went to the moon after World War Two. If you think about time scales and, and human evolution, we went to the moon very quickly. Uh, John F. Kennedy announced right here in Houston at Rice University that in his campaign uh, before the election that we will go to the moon and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. The other things, by the way, is civil rights. It was giving equal rights to every American, no matter what color or where you come from. That's the other things that he's talking about that we're going to do because they're difficult, not because they're easy. Um, but anyways, he said that he said that before. Uh, the United States and task NASA, we're going to go to the moon within this decade and do the other things. Not because they're easy, but because they're hard. So we went to the moon with 1960s technology. 1960s technology. There's probably not a lead acid battery on any modern space probe. There's probably not a lead acid battery in the James Webb Space Telescope. There's, If there are batteries up there, they're undoubtedly lithium if they aren't on a more advanced kind of technology that... that uh, NASA's testing or, or utilizing that we don't quite know about yet or that's not made it to consumer uh, devices yet. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so that was the monumental task is that in the mon monumental achievement in the 1960s is that we went to the moon with 1960s technology. What we have done now with the James Webb Space Telescope was an incredible technological and scientific achievement. So I don't blame the scientists. I don't blame the engineers for those setbacks in, in launch date because I completely understand here. It's a very difficult thing you're doing. But part of me was was took it, you know, kind of emotionally and was was displeased by it because of all the like the hype like stop announcing things if 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 you have a track record over the past decade of not reaching these launch date goals then stop announcing launch dates until you're actually on the launch pad and you're breaking through the atmosphere otherwise it's all crying wolf you know elon musk does a lot of the same thing with some of his products the cyber truck was supposed to come out this year you're not getting the cyber truck this year elon musk likes to announce things that don't come out for for years auto full self-driving autopilot just announce it when it's ready <laughs> that's my old thing but jwst is out there we're going to talk about that more you're listening to geek therapy radio geektherapyradio.com for more information we'll be right back Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. You've got your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. How are you liking this uh, microphone that I'm using? Uh, for those of you who maybe haven't listened to the podcast in a while or listened to the broadcast, I, I've finally uh, bit the bullet and purchased a Electro Voice RE20. Uh, it is the industry standard broadcast microphone. You've listened to a lot of my radio shows in the past uh, before I stopped working directly for iHeart in uh, 2021. Uh, so you've already heard plenty of, of shows recorded on the RE20, uh, technically the RE27ND with a neodymium magnet and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, I, I, as far as recording these podcasts and these shows from home, I was using my tried and true MXLV 67G condenser microphone, but I've switched over now to my just industry standard Electro Voice RE20. How are you liking it? I don't want to get too sidetracked because we're talking about JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope. I went over my emotional issues that I've had with the launch dates and the crying wolf on the launch dates and everything. But it's actually out there. It's actually up there. It's a million miles away from Earth. It's in orbit. And obviously, over the past week or a couple weeks, that you you know, depending on when you're listening to this, we've seen the first official images from the JWST, and they are they are tear inspiring. They are amazing. I felt like crying and my eyes did well up when I saw the first images coming from JD JWST because of how far and how deep you could see. I want to remind you all right now real quick. So most of you, I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to say that most of us saw the first images 
from the James Webb Space Telescope just scrolling through social media or or scrolling through Google or on the web or whatever. But the point is you were looking at it on your smartphone mostly or on your tablet mostly. That's how most of us saw those first images is, you know, scrolling through Facebook, boom, everybody and their grandma was posting images of this. When it and and just seeing that, you know, in a little f- three inch square thing on your phone screen. I know your phone screen's way bigger than three inches, but I'm saying that little square that appears in your feed is, I don't know, what is it, three inches diagonal, whatever. You're seeing it that way. And it's that impressive, that small. And yes, you could kind of pinch and zoom in there a little bit with your smartphone or on your tablet. What you have to realize here, not only is that image a patch of sky the size of a grain of sand at arm's length, all those galaxies, those thousands of galaxies in that image, that just occupies a patch of the sky that is the size of a grain of sand at arm's length. That's just what's there. It's almost imperceptible. You can't even see a grain of sand hardly from arm's length. So anyways, what I'm getting at is here, we are so impressed with that, seeing it in our news feeds uh, on, our, on our phones and tablets. When you, you can easily go to nasa.gov, where am I? Web.nasa.gov, and you can access the full res images of what the web puts out and zoom to your heart's content in detail that you can't even imagine those little red like those little red blobs that you know on your phone screen you can't quite make out because it's so small go to uh, web.nasa.gov w-e-b-b dot nasa.gov and there's other places where you can get it too but get the full res images and these files are massive massive files there are not, i'm not talking about the james webb specifically in this instance but i've downloaded other images from like the hubble and things like that and these are gigs worth of image like one image like what what is the deal with this image whatever being three gigabytes large like that's you're used to jpegs of a few thousand kilobytes like little easily shareable things like the images coming off of the james webb space telescope and hubble and other instruments out there in space are gigantic in size coming from mars from the mars rovers and curiosity and everything like that don't don't just uh you know assume that what you see in your facebook feed is that's the image that's all you can see of the image if you want to you can quite easily just open a new tab or open an, a new app on your phone open up chrome or whatever or, or firefox or duckduckgo or whatever you use and just look for the full res images of these famous images that you're seeing in the news and on your news feed you will be absolutely blown away by how huge these files are and how far you can zoom in to them uh there's a kind of a, a, a funny thing that i wanted to mention because it just popped into my mind one of our radio stations on here uh, reposted a, a f- very funny meme in regards to the James Webb Space Telescope and then like security cameras. It was basically the the now world famous image, the first image coming off of James Webb Space Telescope where you're looking at galaxies 13 and a half billion light years away from the beginning of time. And then on the right is a security camera of a person 10 feet away that's, that's just a blob. Like you can't make out anything on the security camera. And I didn't comment on that and I didn't leave anything, you know, talk to anybody about that because I didn't want to be that guy at the party to, you know, describe the differences between the security camera and the James Webb Space Telescope. But there is some there is a little bit of truth to that ideology. And I I kind of that sentiment. And I've I don't know if I've mentioned on the show before, but, you know, the the phones in our camp and our the, the cameras, it sounds it's kind of a Freudian slip to to say that the cameras in our phones let me get the order right the cameras in our phones are so good that they uh in in a lot of cases put security cameras to shame they're completely different technologies and they're completely different uses and you know i don't want to get into all the the technicals of it but still there are believe me There are plenty of security cameras out there that can zoom in to the hairs and the pores on your nose, that can zoom in to who you're talking to on the cell phone to see the number on the screen, that they can zoom into your driver's license, they can zoom into your credit card in amazing 
detail, high resolution detail. So there are security cameras. Mark, just don't don't be ignorant about this. I mean, there are security cameras out there that can basically zoom into your brain to see what you're thinking. <laughs> They're so powerful and detailed. I'm being a little bit facetious, uh, but yeah, the the whole meme. You know, here's what we can see with the James Webb. Here's what we see of a surveillance camera. A blob, a little blobby perp. It's it's funny, but it's not accurate. The James Webb could not turn around and look at that same perp and get any sort of detail out of it. It would look way worse. Here's the thing. People would ask sometimes. I remember when uh, um, we got the best images we've ever seen from our satellite and our probe that flew around Pluto, which is still the ninth planet in my heart. I watched Coco Melon with Riker and it's like all eight planets. I'm like, it's nine planets. Anyways, <laughs> I want to get too sidetracked with that. Um, but I remember uh, when we first got the images back from Pluto in, in detail and resolution, obviously, that we'd never seen before because we sent a probe to in or, you know, to fly by uh, Pluto. Um, people asked, well, why why can't the Hubble get a detailed picture like this of of Pluto? And they I saw a comparison like here's what a Hubble could get of Pluto. And it was still just not much better than a grainy, fuzzy speck on a screen. So I'm curious what the James Webb can see of Pluto from where it is. And I, I bet you, mark my words on this, that Pluto from the James Webb will look a bit better than the Hubble. But it is still an extremely hard uh object to photograph that is so far away with such little light and yes i know galaxies at the birth of time 13.5 billion years ago are, are hard to see too and the james webb is pulling in all the photons from there but the, the fact remains pluto is still a very hard target to see in any detail so while we will definitely if james webb chooses to point there definitely see pluto from the james webb in, in much better i'll just say better detail than we have seen from the hubble it's still going to be nowhere near as vivid and clear and high resolution and detailed as a camera right in orbit of Pluto. Like, it's it's way easier to take a picture of Pluto from a few hundred miles away than it is to take a picture of Pluto from billions of miles and kilometers away. So, anyways, I just wanted to kind of make that realization about camera technology and kind of how it works and focal lengths and different things like that and just... Just kind of put that in your brain that that's how cameras work, you know, a, a telescope in orbit versus a a camera that's on an aircraft right on top of the subject. It's a little bit different. So anyways, uh, let's talk more about James Webb Space Telescope uh, coming up. You're listening to Geek Therapy Radio. I'm your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Feel free to email me directly, johnny at geektherapyradio.com, J-O-H-N-N-Y at geektherapyradio.com. Also all the socials. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. How poignant for this episode and for this radio show that the bump music you're listening to by Adam Young, who you may know as Owl City, the bump music is titled Pale Blue Dot from an album he released, a soundtrack album he released called Voyager, all about the Voyager space probe. And Pale Blue Dot uh, refers to, you know, Voyager looking back at Earth, I think it was from Saturn. When it passed Saturn and Voyager got all those awesome pictures of the, the rings of Saturn and through the rings of Saturn was a pale blue dot. And that was Earth. Uh, so the when you get that far away from a, from an object, from a planet, it's very difficult to pull in detail. Now, we can look at, I guarantee, well, guarantee you, when James Webb points its camera at Jupiter, it's going to be even stupider. <laughs> like It's going to be stupider how good the uh, quality is, but it's not going to be anywhere near, what is it, Juno, I believe we sent to, to Jupiter, taking those extremely high resolution and detailed pictures right out off the atmosphere of, of Jupiter up close and personal. It's amazing. Um, but James Webb pointed at Jupiter. It's going to look amazing because uh, Hubble pointed at Jupiter. It looked amazing. The thing about Jupiter and Saturn is that they are 
gargantuan. They are huge planets. It's not like Pluto, which is basically a floating rock in comparison in why Pluto is no longer the ninth planet, because it's technically too small uh, in the under the new categorization of planets. Um, but Jupiter and Saturn are massive. You can look through your telescope at home. I can go in my backyard right now, even using a little three inch, you know, aperture uh, telescope, three inch mirror reflector telescope. You can look at Jupiter and see uh, the bands of the atmosphere. You can see, you can even see moons surrounding Jupiter just with a little cheap sub $100 backyard telescope and you can see the rings of Saturn in pretty decent you know awe-inspiring detail from the same telescope because those are known as gas giants they're huge they are very big if you look at Mars through a backyard telescope it depends because there's lots of dust storms on Mars but if you look at it uh, and there's it's relatively quiet you can kind of see little dark areas and features of the surface very very uh non-distinctly uh if you're really lucky you can see the polar ice cap um like little white spludge spludge on the you know on the cap of 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 mars through the backyard telescope so yeah james webb is going to be able to get a lot better images than that than you can with the backyard telescope because it's a million miles closer and has zero atmosphere to go through and simply gargantuan mirrors that can capture simply gargantuan amounts of light uh, so anyways, let's talk a little bit about uh, that a little bit and like what the James Webb can gather. So I, I think it's important to, uh, to to point out here that the James Webb Space Telescope is is very much uh, an instrument, a critical instrument in the exploration of exoplanets. That is looking at planets that are orbiting neighboring stars. And one of the things that James Webb is going to be able to do is not only have our best shot of actually optically looking at a planet, not a star, but a planet around a star, which as I'm saying it, it's, it's always mind boggling. So not only will we be able to potentially see the actual planet itself, it's going to be pale blue dot, pale red dot, pale orange dot, whatever it is, it's a little blob. The fact that it's a little blob yeah, to the layperson might seem might seem unimpressive. It's just a wow. Okay, well, you're looking at a friggin' planet. You're looking at another planet that isn't one of our planets around our sun. That alone, that little when you put it into perspective of what that little splodge is on your screen, that it's another planet on a distant star. It's remarkable and it's breathtaking and it's awe-inspiring that we're able to see that now but that's not the most impressive thing that's it is impressive but that's not the most impressive thing what's impressive is more the instruments that the T james webb space telescope contains i think uh, back to what i was saying a lot of lay people might think that it's just a fancy camera out in space so you can look at galaxies there are Hundreds of more instruments, dozens of more instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope. That's not only going to help us see the planet around the star, even as a little smudge, but it has instruments that are capable of doing what's called spectro. Uh, I can't. I I always have a hard time pronouncing this spectroscopy, which basically what it means is uh, it's transmission spectro spectroscopy. Basically, what it means is that when a planet goes in front of a star it can see the james webb space telescope will see the light passing through that planet's atmosphere from its star and be able to determine what elements are in that atmosphere so let me kind of complete this picture for you that means when james webb's web undoubtedly finds planets within the star's habitable zone that means stars that are planets that are close enough and, or, and farther enough from the star that it is uh, similar to earth like conditions as far as the heat that the atmosphere uh, holds in or emits or whatever that our planet earth exists with, within the habitable zone of our star and we have oxygen we have nitrogen and we have uh, water and carbon dioxide and all the different elements on earth that are conductive to life conducive to life that you can be able to detect these things on planets orbiting other stars now through the use of spectroscopy so 
if an exoplanet goes in front of its star and we use our spectrometers to see what the atmosphere is made of, the elements in that atmosphere say, oh, okay, that atmosphere definitely contains oxygen. That atmosphere definitely contains nitrogen. We are detecting water vapor. We are detecting uh, greenhouse gases. Here's the thing that I mentioned on my personal Facebook that almost, you know, none of y'all saw because it's my personal Facebook. When you're using spectroscopy and we start getting back signatures of uh, combustion, so, you know, I'll let that sink in for a second. A lot of the times we're looking for water. We're looking for traces of water. We're looking for water on our, on planets in our own solar system. To me, equally as important, if not a more direct identifier of intelligent life on other planets, because it's one thing to determine, speculate whether a planet has life. If there's life on another planet, but it's just like plants... It's just, as we know it anyways, it's just kind of plants and maybe there's some low intelligence creatures or, or sub-evolved, whatever. That's one thing. Obviously, that's going to be, that's going to change the world. That's going to, that's going to change life as we know it on our planet when we discover life on another planet. And I believe it's coming. You know, it'd be a stretch. You know, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that we may discover life on another planet in my lifetime. I am 38 years old. Don't know how many decades I have left on this Earth, but I think I think we'll put a human on Mars, and I think we will detect certain life on other planets. So we talked about detecting water. Every time we're looking around at different planets around our solar system and even trying to look at planets outside the solar system, we're looking for traces of water because water is what we know to be conducive to life on Earth. Primordial soup, all that kind of good stuff. It all depends on water. Everything in this world needs water to survive. The plankton lives in water, is fed by energy from the sun. The, pl- the plankton is the basis of the entire food chain, and it requires water. Our bodies are 75% water, or whatever it is, 76% water. Water is very important. So that will determine you know, the likelihood of life, but, but a sure sign, the bullseye, the guaranteed indicator of life and the guaranteed indicator of intelligent life is if we start detecting combustion. Greenhouse gases that you get from combustion of fossil fuels, that will tell us that that planet has intelligent life engaging in industry, maybe engaging in uh, local travel, you know, transportation, uh, developing their own technologies, you know, using fossil fuels to, 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 to power things, to make things, to do whatever. If you detect traces of combustion on another planet, not only have you definitely found life, but you have definitely found intelligent life. So I'm waiting for the word. I'm waiting for the detection of, of combustion and gases from combustion on another planet that's the no doubter that there's life and if we find a planet that atmosphere is comprised of a lot of combustion elements we are gonna laser beam focus our antennas on that and just start blasting them with radio waves to make contact it's basically like SETI but now you know exactly where you'd be looking that's the type of instrumentation that the James Webb Space Telescope has so it's not just pretty Pictures that we're going to use as wallpapers and and lock screens on our phones and on our desktops, wallpapers. This is the best instrument we have out there in the quest to find life elsewhere in the solar system. It is not far-fetched to say that, mathematically speaking, life is a virtual guarantee out there in the universe. James Webb is going to take us all the closer to discovering it. And that means all the closer to making contact with it. Is that going to wind up being a good or bad thing? Will they let us into the Federation? Will they give us warp? More Geek Therapy Radio. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. You've got your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. All right, we are in the fourth and final segment. Now I'll do my little pluggity doodahs. It's real quick. It's just Geek Therapy Radio, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, TikTok, uh, geektherapyradio.com. And you can email me directly, Johnny, J-O-H-N-N-Y, at geektherapyradio.com. You can also just go to geektherapyradio.com. And the first thing you friggin' see is a contact form. Just 
you know, type in your name or whatever, your alias if you want, and just kind of it asks you what's your geek thing. And that's kind of how you get in touch with me. It just basically dings my inbox, says, hey, you've got a message on your website. It does not sign you up for a mailing list. I do not try to sell you stuff. I technically have a pitiful merch store. I don't think anybody's bought anything for the merch store because I don't promote it enough. It's kind of way out tucked away. I opened it during 2020 and during uh and we still have ongoing you know production issues and things like that transport issues of actually making things uh but it exists all i'm saying is you fill out if you contact me through the website it does not put you on a on a mailing list it doesn't send you anything it doesn't like pimp my merch or anything like that it's just literally just way to talk to me the best way to talk to me i'll tell you the best way to get my attention quickly is twitter I think it's at Geek Therapy KPRC on Twitter. Like literally, if you just got onto Twitter or anything really and just type in Geek Therapy Radio and look for the red, white, and black color scheme, that's how you got me. But Twitter is a fantastic way to at me <laughs> and get my attention instantly. Uh, I check Twitter throughout the day. A lot of my favorite radio hosts and tech people are on Twitter, so I'm constantly cruising through through Twitter. Uh, so, and I'll see my little inbox or the notification. And uh, it's a very quick way to get to me. Email is good, too, obviously. Uh, but Twitter is your best shot of getting my attention immediately. Uh, I had somebody ask me, uh, Kenzo, shout out Kenzo in uh, the Netherlands. You asked me if I had uh, uh, played the Mr. FPGA or have any uh, experience with FPGA, you know, emulation in general. FPGA, I was a field programmable off the top of my head, field programmable. Uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking on it. I don't want to look it up. I'll look it up right now as I'm recording and I'll fill this time of Google searching FPGA meaning uh, field programmable gate array. I knew it. Gate array. Field programmable gate array. Anyway, it's it's the most uh, 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 it's the most uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Accurate way of emulating other systems other like video game systems and other computers for instance so there are devices out there i have talked on the show a lot you know in in the past about uh, how i was so hyped for the analog pocket which is an fpga based device so if you play game boy games or super nintendo games or game gear games or whatever old school systems on the analog pocket that it would use a uh, field programmable gate array fpga to emulate uh, an actual circuit because it is an actual circuit it's making actual circuits to emulate actual hardware it's still emulation technically because it's not playing a game boy on not a game boy fpga is still technically emulation but it's the most accurate way of emulation because you're you're using hardware to emulate hardware most emulation is done in, in software like as you know it like you're trying to play you know playstation 2 games on your i was going to say mac you're not playing PlayStation 2 games on Mac, not easily, at least, not without boot camp and other, you know, emulating PC. It's a mess. Better example, if you're playing Super Nintendo on your PC or your phone or your Mac, it's using software to emulate. And it's running the software through your graphics card, your GPU, whatever, sometimes your CPU. It's using software to emulate hardware. FPGA, this is a way better way to put it, uses hardware to emulate hardware. So it's a much more accurate way to emulate other systems but kenzo i don't i already responded to your email uh i don't have any experience with it myself i haven't played it yet i was so hyped for the analog pocket i still am hyped for analog pocket but i have not bought an analog pocket um what do they cost like 200 bucks or 230 bucks i knew they had some supply issues in the past I'll, i'll get an analog pocket um at some point in the near future it's already been hacked uh, to allow you to put ROMs on a micro SD card, which we all knew would happen. Um, but I'll get it at some point in the future. I want to point out something here, uh, that, um, Asaf, uh, who's often in, in Tel Aviv in Israel, uh, the last, at the end of the last show that I did, I mentioned that I had crowdfunded on Indiegogo, the GPD win max, uh, three, by the way, it's not the three, it's a GPD win max two. So let me just rectify that. Sometimes I'm going to say things on here just in passing and I'll get things a little bit wrong. Just just know that I'm trying. <laughs> things just kind of slip out and it's I'm not doing it on purpose. The GPD Win Max 2, I did crowdfund it. The reason I'm bringing this up is because Asaf asked me, he's like, I thought you didn't uh, uh, pre-order things. It's like, yeah, I, I usually don't. That's my general rule of thumb is I don't pre-order things, you know, until they come out. Um, 
but that is especially true with software. The last game that I pre-ordered, I'll put things on the wish list, but I won't pre-order. Like on Steam or in the Nintendo eShop or whatever like that, I will put things on the wish list, but I will not be giving Nintendo or whoever $40 for a game that doesn't exist yet. I will never do that again. I did The last time I did that was with Street Fighter V, and that was the... The fool me twice. I get fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I've been, we've all been fooled so many times by pre-ordering that it's just a rule of thumb: don't do it, especially with software. Now, I did pre-order slash crowdfund the GPD Win Max Two. I have been waiting for a device like this all of my life. Just the perfect all-in-one device that not only you know plays games on, has integrated uh, like PS Vita-esque controls on it, but that had a powerful enough GPU that I could do video editing on the go and a powerful enough CPU to do whatever else I need to do, video editing also. So not only is it an amazing device that could play AAA games and emulate almost anything under the sun, if not everything currently under the sun on it, but I can get real work done on it in a very travel-friendly form factor, so many ports, it makes every Apple device shudder and weep. Uh, it's just the perfect, perfect device. But here's why I crowdfunded it. Here's why I pre-ordered this hardware. And I briefly, I told us off about this. I said, I, I have done so with GPD in the past. They have a very good proven track record. It's not just me. And I'm not promoting GPD in any way, shape, or form or telling you that you should definitely go... Uh, crowdfund this thing i'm just saying i have with gpd in the past on two separate products uh myself crowdfunded and and pre-ordered and it's it's been wonderful and you typically when you crowdfund you typically get a pretty substantial discount and that's that's uh nothing is different here with the gpd win max too there's a a really good discount when you pre-order. And if it's a company that has proven itself with a track record of delivering on time and delivering good products, excellent products, and I have a personal experience with this company, you know, backing them in the past, it's easier for me to do. Now, like there's companies like AYN and and stuff like that, making the AYN, the Neo and different devices and Loki and stuff like coming out. Really cool, coming out with like the 6800 AMD chip and other chips, other AMD chips, even Intel chips, but they don't have the same track record as uh, GPD does. So I'm way less likely ever to crowdfund a company like that until it has kind of proven itself. I'm not saying AYN is a bad company at all, at all. I just don't have experience crowdfunding them or pre-ordering from them, so I just won't. Um, until I see that they have a proven track record. GPD has a proven track record. I've experienced that proven track record. So I did uh, uh, crowdfund that. Last thing I want to say, I am on a dual screen setup here with my laptop. I'm using a, an app called uh, Super Display that I personally just discovered like a day or two ago. It lets you use your Android, this is not an ad, this lets you use your Android device, whether it's your phone or tablet, as a, an external monitor with your PC. And it works flawlessly. Uh, they do like a three day trial period. I bought the full version for 10 bucks within the first 30 seconds. Uh, amazing. I can take my uh, Samsung Galaxy Tab S6 with me on the road, attach it to my uh, Asus or my yeah Zephyrus G14 here, and have an external monitor that's accurate and fast, and you can even game casually on it. Uh, it's just amazing. You don't have to bring an external monitor. Just use your tablet or your phone as an external monitor. It is called Super Display. You download the app in Google Play Store, download the driver for Windows, and you're off to the races. You are worthy of love. You're worthy of giving and receiving love, and you're worthy of your own self-respect. Thank you so much for listening to Geek Therapy Radio. Tell your friends about Geek Therapy Radio. Take care.